you know where we're going. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Talking about the, that gate, the narrow way, that straight gate and the narrow way. And the Bible says there's only few that enter in. I think about that and I think about Noah. There wasn't a whole lot of people on that boat. There's more animals than there was people. And I think it'll be that way when we get to heaven. A lot of people that we may think we'll see, we may not see them. Because only a few will enter in. The Lord put this on my heart. I've been studying as we go along in Matthew. I've been reading over some of this and studying. And I felt led to preach on false teachers last week. And I didn't do that. I laid off because Charlie's fixing to get into that. Fixing to get into this too. But the Lord laid on my heart to speak on this today. And we'll trust Him. I know He takes me where He wants me to go. Uh, verse 7 Chapter 7, verse 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many, many there be which go in thereat. It says in verse 14, Because straight is the gate, and narrow the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Right. God put it on the heart about this little church and what He's doing here. I think there's a few people here found God in this church. I think there's a few people here that's on the, that narrow path, the narrow road that leads us all to glory one day. And then it goes on and says, Beware of the false prophets which come into you in sheep's clothing, but in, inwardly there are ravening wolves, ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes or thorns or figs or thistles? You know, I think about that straight gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads. Every time I think about that, I don't know why I think about I love my wife, she, she loves it too. Her children are grown, used to it. Was a, she liked to get there in a hurry if we went on a trip because we had kids in the back fussing and fighting. Y'all know how that is. But now it's just me and her sitting and she enjoys it. She likes to sleep while I drive or read or crochet. And when I go somewhere, I just say, uh, if I'm going over to Golden Valley instead of going to Pope for around, I just go out Golden Valley Road back through this country, that little narrow, curve and winding road. And I enjoy it because there's streams on both sides and the trail, all the things you see. I, I came all the way back from the beach one time on Highway 9, just come up through instead of coming the quick way. It took me all day to get home. I enjoy it. But I like the little narrow roads. and. and the older I get, the more traffic bothers me anyway, try, trying to drive the interstate. And I know Frank and Merle, they commute back and forth to Florida in 95. Y'all need to get a helicopter, Frank. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't do that that much, I don't think. I need to have her sleep. You, 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 you got more patience than I have to drive 95 back and forth. But I don't like that wide road and all that traffic. And But I get a picture of that when I think about these verses because you get on the interstate and they're, they're adding more lanes now down in South Carolina 85. Mm -hmm. It just can't never get wide enough because so many people's going mm -hmm. and they're in a hurry. Whoa, they going. But you get on the back roads and there's very few cars. You just, you know, you drive slower and you go through the towns and you see things, but there's not a lot of people on those roads anymore. And I think about that when I think about that verse, uh, straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life and that's the way it is our walk with the Lord 
I've read, I've got a set of commentaries back there. My son gave me his first year in school from Vernon McGee, J. Vernon McGee. I know Charlie, some of y'all may have heard him preach. He's, he's gone on to be with the Lord, but I was reading his commentor, commentary on these verses, and the way he taught that, he said he thought of it as a funnel. And that made a real good picture, and I, I thought about that. I want to share it with y'all. If you enter in the funnel, you know, you talk about a funnel, you got the wide end of the funnel, and you put a whole lot of stuff in there, and it all comes out down here. When it comes out, it's all small, and that's all you got left. It just goes where it's going. To. And then his uh, teaching of it, he said, when it comes out of that funnel, you look at the destruction, it just takes you right on into hell. Coming down the wide road, and the wide gate, right on into hell. He said, turn it over. And you got a, a narrow gate, a straight gate, a little place you can enter in. And when you go in the narrow way, it just keeps getting bigger coming out the other side. And he, that, that was his picture of our, our life as a Christian. I thought about that in this church. Uh, it gets better and better every day. Our Christian walk, if you're serving God and you're living for God and you're, you're being obedient to God and you're staying full of the Holy Spirit and doing the things of God, your life gets better every day. Amen. It just keeps getting bigger. Even though we're on the straight and narrow, we enter in that, that straight gate and we're on that narrow road. It's just like going down the interstate. Many of y'all get out and, and travel. You down the interstate, all you see is that car truck in front of you and one in your mirror. Everybody's driving 90 miles an hour. You can't look around. And when you do, you just see buildings. And you, but when you're on that narrow road, you don't have no pressure. You know, you don't have all that traffic and you, it gets, you got a wide open view. You see the pasture and the cows and the mountains and the trees and the rivers, you can just enjoy it. You see more, you get more out of life going down that road. And I thought that was a good example he used of the funnel. You go in and then I thought about it all the way to the end and just think what it's gonna be when we cross over. Amen. Bible says we can't even comprehend, we can't even, we, we don't have no idea how it's going to be on the other side. And I thought that was a real good illustration. Uh, it helped me. I hope it helps y'all. But he says, I've come. He says, that the, when you go in the narrow way, it leads to life eternal. We come through Christ into that. And it just mushrooms and it gets better. God blesses us. Blesses our family. Blesses the things we do. And he looks after us. Jesus said, I come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. You know, sometimes we look at our life and we all go through struggles. We go up and down hills and through valleys. We all have bumps in the road. And he's talking about in the Bible study, turning your cheek. Being a Christian is not an easy thing to do, folks. It's a whole lot easier to live for the devil than it is to live for the Lord. And these preachers that get out and preach and say, if you just give your life to Christ, it'd be a piece of cake from here on. I wonder if they're even saved sometimes when they say that. Uh, I struggle every day. I don't know about y'all. I struggle every day. The devil don't like me doing what I do. He don't like you doing what you do if you live for the Lord. Amen. As long as you're not doing nothing for the Lord, you won't have any bumps in the road. But if you're, if you're on that straight and narrow, and you're trying to resist the temptations of the devil and the things that he's throwing at you, you're going to fight. Uh, you look at it, the war's won. The war's over. And God says, we've got victory. I've got my victory through Jesus Christ. I know where I'm going when it's over. But I'm on, still on the battlefield. Right. And you are too if you're a Christian. We fight every day the temptations, the lust of the flesh, the things that go on in our life. Uh, even what Don, that verse you brought up there in Matthew about turning the other cheek, that's a hard thing to do. There's a lot of hard things to do being a Christian. One of my hard things is not running people off the road when they cut me off or pull. You know, God, God dealt with me about that and took that away. I don't get angry much anymore on the road, and I thank God for that. Amen. But the longer you walk with the Lord, the better it gets. Amen. It's just like that funnel, it just gets wider. And eventually it's just going to open right up into heaven one day into glory. You know, in Ezekiel, he prophesied that they said there was a river. I think it was 
I'm not sure, 47 in Ezekiel, I'm not sure what chapter, but he prophesied of a river flowing from the throne of God, he said, which is a little stream, and then it widened and became a great river. And that's kind of the way God blesses his children. You know, God gives us a little bit at a time, and then he gives us a little more and a little more and a little more, and it just keeps getting better and better. If we're obedient, if we don't use what He gives us right, it'll slow down a little bit. Uh, it's, there's a picture there, a few, that come to be a child of God. A lot of people come to church. I had a whole other sermon back there that started talking about religion. It, uh, I remember some of my notes and I told Stephen, if, if we come in here and I ask you, how many of y'all in here are religious people? I mean, y'all really religious. Probably everybody in there said, well, I am, I go to church and all. That's good. Being religious won't get you into heaven. Being saved, being born again, is the only thing that gets you into heaven. Being a believer, a real Christian. There's a few. I don't know how many we got in here today, 25 or 30. I, I, my prayer is that everybody in here is part of that family, part of that few. But I, if I was sitting in a church where there's 200, I'm sure there'd be some in there that's in the many crowd and not in the few. You get 50 people together, and chances are there's going to be a few of them that's going to heaven. There's a few that's been deceived by Satan and think they're going to heaven, just like Sister Beth was, just like Brother Mark was. There's no better place than the devil would want you to be to have you sitting in church trying to worship Jesus, which you can't without Him in your life. We worship God in spirit and truth, and if you don't have a spirit, you can't really worship. But you can play church. You can go and sing the songs, lift your hands, do everything that church people do, that Christians do, but you're not worshiping God because you don't have a spirit. There's a few in the churches really worshiping, and there's a a many in the churches, many that claim to be Christians are not in that few. They wouldn't have been on the boat with Noah. We live an abundant life if we, you know, we, we, I, if y'all like me, I, I beat myself up a lot of times. I wish I had more. I wish I had a new car. I wish I had a bigger house. I wish I had better things. How I many of us, if we're as honest, would say that? Most all of us. We're blessed. We're so blessed. Everybody came to church this morning, came in a car, probably an air conditioned car, except for. It's fixed. Charles, our AC is out. We got here in a car. We're in a building, an old store building, but we're in a building. We're sheltered from the outside weather. We've got light, debt free, it belongs to God. We got air conditioning in here. We had coffee and breakfast cake. Uh, we all got a home to go back to. We all got clothes on us. We got shoes on our feet and food on the table to eat there, Lisa. We're so blessed. We're so blessed. And we take all that for granted. We live an abundant life if you're on the narrow way. And what Charlie was talking about a while ago, we see people, uh, I know Terry sings that song, Farther Along. We see people doing better than us. They may be lost as a ball in high weeds. We may know them and we know they don't love the Lord. And they got a big nice house, they got a high paying job. They, it looks like they got everything they ever need. And we envy them sometimes, we covet that. And then we look at God and we say, God, I serve you. I believe in you. I'm one of your children. How come my neighbor's got that big house and car and, and they don't even think they, they make fun of you and they mock you? And we don't understand that. But just like they said, it rains on the just and the unjust. The sun shines. God, they've got an opportunity to get what they can while they're here. But when it's all over, it's all over. I got an opportunity to get all I can get while I'm here, and when I get there, He'll reward me with it. Yes. My treasure is in heaven. My reward's in heaven. Yes. It's not here, yes. and that's the way a Christian lives. We we're on that road, 
It don't matter about the new car. It don't matter about the new house to me. All that, sure, we'd all love to have it, and there's nothing wrong with having all that stuff. But my, we live an abundant life if we're a Christian. God meets our every need. We got an eternal home. <coughs> I'm on my way to that eternal home. That straight gate to me is that invitation where the Lord knocks on your heart's door. It says, come to me, all that labor. I'll give you rest. We've been studying. Charlie's, Charlie's real good about throwing the Jews in here all the time. And you think about the Jews, how they labored on this side of the cross of the Charlie's Old Testament. They worked. Many people out here today work. They go to church. They go to church because they think they're going to get in heaven because they go to church to try to do good. I go to church because Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. Amen. And I believe Him. And I believe in Him. And I believe the Gospel. And I asked Him to save me and He did. Uh, all you that labor, come to me, I'll give you rest. I'm glad I learned that. Then He tells me out here you know, to beware of the false prophet. False teacher. He's talking about over here the Jews. That he had all these prophets telling them all these things. And Jesus was trying to warn them about all that. Paul done it for many, many years. Tried to tell them. We're still doing it today. Teaching and preaching in here, not to the Jews, but to the lost, to, to each one of us. Beware of the false teachers, the false preachers, the false prophets. I can't help but think of all these prosperity preachers and even some right here in this community. It says they'll come to you in sheep's clothing. How many preachers do you know that dress up real nice and they look real good? And they got all that charisma and they know how to get up there and put on a good show. And they know how to take you down and bring you up, make you cry and make you laugh because they know the Word of God. They've studied it. You know some schools even teach preachers to have acting classes in them? Oh, yeah. Some of these cemeteries, oh, seminaries, I call them cemeteries, <laughs> where they kill good preachers and bury them. <laughs> they teach you how to act. They teach you how to smile. They teach you how to move your hands and do all those things. They need to teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ is what they need to teach them, man. Yeah. But it says, they'll come to you like that. You think about in churches, I'm, I'm not I'm not calling anybody's names. I'm not going to do it. There's a huge church. There's mega churches over here in Charlotte now. I mean, there's big churches in show. You got preachers up there today, $500,000 suits, Rolex watches, driving big fire cars, doing what I'm doing. A lot of us just up there uh, giving their opinion on how you ought to do better and how God will bless you if you'll do this and do that. And if you'll make sure you leave $100 in that offering, He'll double it next week for you, telling you things like that, brainwashing people. But the TV is the biggest place for them. And, and you know, my opinion on a pastor, I don't think a pastor ought to live any better than anybody else. If God blesses his people, that's fine. I don't, I'm not saying that. Some pastors live in fine houses, drive fine cars, and they deserve it, and they pay for it the right way. It's not where they take money from the church, from the congregation to do it. But he says, beware of them. Because they come in sheep's clothes, they dress up and they look good. But on, they're really wolves. Ravening wolves. You know what that means? That means ferocious. That means ferocious. And they're trying to feed their hungry. They're hungry. That's talking about a hungry wolf out here walking around, hunting something to eat. And you think about the churches and the preachers, these false teachers. All they worried about how much money is going to come in this month. How much money comes in this week? So they can live that lifestyle they live. There's been one on the news lately about their, uh, their Learjets and their Cadillacs, how many cars they got. Preacher over here in Charlotte living in a $5 million home. False teachers. And that church is packed full probably right now. Thousands of them in there listening to what the man's telling them. Right now. And they could be in a little church like this here the Word of God preached. Amen. But they look good. They smell good. And they do good. Standing up in front of everybody. But it says, he tells them, Charlie will go through this, I'm sure, and help us out on this. 
And verse 16 it says, You shall know them by their fruits. By their fruits. When you find a, a church like that, or a preacher or a teacher like that, have they got people that their lives are being changed? Have you got people that's being born again, rededicating and recommitting themselves to the Lord, to live for the Lord? Or have you got people driving big fine cars trying to make more money, going to the gyms and working out with them and getting on TV and promoting their church and spending millions of dollars to make it bigger and prettier so you can get more to come and give more? That's, what, that's the kind of false teachers we've got now. And we've got them telling, there's, I guess, the biggest church in our country. Uh, I'll go ahead and call him out for you if y'all don't know him, Joel Osteen. He says there's more than one way to go to heaven, and that's a lot straight out of hell. Yeah. That's right. Good. Biggest church in this country, I imagine, out there in Texas. But he says, beware of them. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're like a wolf. They're hungry. They want to get you. They want to get your money. They may look like a preacher, act like a preacher, talk like a preacher, but on the inside, they're not. That's why it's so important to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Know the Word of God. So when somebody gets up and preaches or speaks to you or you listen on the radio or TV, whatever they're teaching, if it's not in this book, if it don't line up with God's Word, they're false teachers. They're teaching their opinion. They're teaching something entirely different from this book. They're false. They're fake. You need to be filled with the whole... You need to be studying the Word of God. The Bible says study the Word of God and show yourself to prove a good workman. A good workman. You know, I think about we're working on the building in here. That's work. That's hard work, physical work. I've been tired. Don's been tired. We life we're getting old. We come in the morning, we're all stove, so we get going and get loosened up. Then by the end of the evening, we're wore out again. But it takes more than working on the building. It takes more than having dinner. It takes more than singing. It takes work studying the Word of God. Amen. He says study the Word of God and show yourself a workman approved. That's work. That's one of the costs. It's not easy being a Christian. If you don't do that, you'll believe everything you hear. That's right. You can come in here. I'm preaching right, out of the, right off the page. He read right and Jesus Christ spoke Himself. You can go home, turn the radio on on the way home. Some preacher tell you something entirely different than that. And if you don't know that it's really the Word of God, you'll believe Him before you believe me. And I'm telling you what Jesus said. That's why it's important to know, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to know the Word of God. See, if you're born again, the Bible teaches the Holy Spirit lives in you. He guides you. He directs you. He tells you. when so, He gives you discernment. When somebody's lying to you, God will tell you. Not only in Scripture, but in business or something. Somebody's telling you something and all of a sudden something in here says, that's not right. You better listen because you're fixing to get hoodoo. God's telling you because your Holy Spirit is your teacher and your guide and your leader once you become a Christian. You need to listen to Him or you'll be on that big wide road with the rest of them. That's why there's only a few. It's amazing how all this got started about the church this morning. A few, only a few will enter in, only a few will be on that road. We could all be at a big old church somewhere with a coliseum of 5,000 people right now. Who doing all that, doing all that stuff and all them lights flashing and fog machines going off and everybody's so happy clapping hands like that. And I'd say, you're on the interstate, buddy. You better get out of here. You better get on the back road. It's going on left and right more now than ever. Yes, sir. Jesus preached against it. Paul preached against it. The Lord's age on my heart to warn our people. Uh, you'll know them by the fruit. What kind of fruit does it have? We need to look at them. If, if you're watching or going to a church or thinking about <coughs> going to a church, is that teacher or preacher, does he have compassion? Is he Christ-like? That's what gets me about preachers in five million dollars. Huh? Jesus Christ was a homeless man. He never even had a home. His home was in heaven. My home's in heaven. I just got a place to stay while I'm here. Right. 
I don't care if it's a ten thousand dollar camper or a hundred thousand dollar house, don't matter to me. But you better check them see if they have compassion. Do they care about you? Do they really care? Do they call you when you're sick? Do they come see you when you're sick? Do they bring food to you? Do they help you? Or get somebody out of their church to do it? Get your help when you need it? Do they show partiality? There's another good Christ-like example. If you don't have money in a big car, they, what was that you told me that day? They call them, uh, the ones, what, not what we can do for you, but what y'all can do for me. What do they call them? Uh, anyway, Consumer. consumer Christians. They call them consumer church people. The big churches don't want them. They come in there and, and, and they need something. They don't want them in. They call them consumers. Mm -hmm. They come in here getting our money, using our money. We want. They want the ones that come in there that give, not consume. Them. We don't want to have to buy them groceries. We don't have to pay their heat bill. They don't want to spend. That's like I want to say those things again. I'll probably get in trouble. When the hurricane hit, he shut the church up. They was needing places of shelter for all them people down there in Texas. He shut the church up with their music. Right. It made the news after it got on the news. He opened up a little bit. That shows you the fruit that man had in him. Did they help the poor? We're, I think one of the reasons this place is paid for, we're moving on back here. We, we're not borrowing money. We're doing it as we go. We put people here, a lot of y'all lot of y'all don't know this. Terry's here now, he knows kind of when we do things, but I remember going to Brother Charlie, I'd call him or Russell and I'd say, I don't think about doing to you. Charlie told me one day, he said, Look, I'll give you my opinion and help you anywhere I can. He said, You don't have to call that somebody. I've never heard anybody in that church complain about anything you ever done. We bought groceries, we bought cars, we paid house payments, we put people in motels, on and on and on. It's all about, it's not to get glory to me or us for what we do, it's doing God's work. And, and we, when we started, we didn't have nothing. We couldn't help many people, but we, we don't give, we don't have like a big mission thing, give a whole bunch of money to mission boards and all these things, but we help people. We help people in our community, our brother, our people in our church. I think God's blessed us mightily for doing the things we do like that. Amen. But what about those false teachers? Do they do it? I remember when uh, Doug died and we bought Linda a car. God put it on my heart to help her. She was a widow. And I remember what I said that night. The Bible says that, that a widow indeed. She didn't have nobody. She had one sister. She didn't have nobody. And this little church bought her a car and give it to her. And I remember the whole talk for a while. I've never heard tell the church doing anything like that. <coughs> now everybody in our church wants you to buy them a car before it breaks down. You know, everybody started giving me all negative things and I thought, that might have been stupid for what I've done, you know. But it wasn't. Nobody's ever asked for another car. If everybody needs one and we can do it, we will. But that was what, that's, that was the fruit. I'm not bragging on me, I'm bragging on this church. Amen. And that's how you know the false teachers. They'll do different things. Another thing you can check them out, do they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Paul said any other things vain. If they don't preach the gospel, turn from them. If they tell you there's another way to get to heaven, they're a false teacher. Their fruit will tell you who they are. It'll tell you whether they're ser serving themselves or God. Serving man or God. Don't be deceived and miss the gate. The Bible says, straight the gate, narrow is the way. Few there be that find it. You know, we all have an opportunity to come to the Lord if you're in this church. I try to get the gospel out. Try my best to in some way every time I speak when I preach. I try to do that. That's the only way to heaven. And I think about all these false teachers. You know, I'm not eloquent. I don't have no education. God didn't know I was a high school dropout. 
He was talking about, he dropped out of school. He said, how do you get up and read like you do? I said, God helps me, all I can tell you. But I didn't go to no seminary. I went to a little Bible college down here in South Carolina. God gives me everything I need. I've said it from the beginning. Max used to get mad when I'd get up there and say, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I'm just following Jesus. And that's all the preacher needs to do, follow Jesus. That's all we need to do. That's all you need to do. That's all you'll ever need is Jesus. We follow Him. And he goes on down here and says, I think about, he says, he uh, talks about the fruit. I'm going to skip on it. said, Every tree that bringeth, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into a fire. I've always thought that, you know, if I didn't bring fruit as a, as a Christian, I was going to die and go to hell. I, I, I took that all wrong for a long time. But he's talking about these false teachers here. These false teachers, and I don't know if they're saved or not. But he goes on down here in verse 20 and says, Wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. This is the same for you and I also. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father. He that doeth the will. No matter how much of it you know, it's he that doeth the will of the Father, which is in heaven. And he goes on here, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? How many of these false teachers you ever seen to get up and prophesy, Lord's coming back and telling you all these things? Prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name do many wonderful words. He's talking about these priests in the Old Testament, what he's talking to them about the Jews, he, like Charlie says to the Jews. But he's also talking to us about in the day's time. You turn on the TV and you see these people going up, putting their hands on people and healing them, and you see them getting them out of a wheelchair and dancing around. No man can do that. God can. I'm not saying God don't heal a lame man. God will heal anybody who wants to. You see preachers putting on shows so people give them more money. We see it all the time. You got people sitting in churches like this that sends money out. Every week that they could be putting in the local church to help the minister minister to the needs of the church and the people. But they're being deceived by false teachers, false doctrines. In verse 23, this is one of the if this verse right here don't hit you in the heart, there's not a verse in this Bible will. We do all kinds of good things. I could get in here, I could take that verse and say, if I don't promise that, if I not told them you're coming back, Lord, I've told the church you're coming back. If we don't pray and see people saved, got the devil out of them, got them saved, we're doing a lot of good works, Lord. But then he looks at it on verse 23, he says, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And I think about that verse, and I think about the verses ahead of that. Charlie's going to clear all this up because I'm probably out of context on some of this. I think about many on that wide road they get a little bit of it and they listen to these feel good preachers out here preaching all this stuff motivational speakers what I call most of these people you know the church I, I was reading there's over uh, 4,000 churches shut down last year that we know of people's not going to a congregation like this They're, the Bible says we're to congregate together assemble together to study the Word of God, to pray together, to sing hymns and praise Christ, praise God, together. People don't do it no more. They go down the road with the radio on, they turn on the TV, the energy. That's the preaching most people's getting these days, unless they're in a church. And all, most of the people, if you go listen, they're not preaching the book, they're not preaching the gospel. They're being fed all this stuff. That's why they're on the wide road. People need to be in church where somebody's teaching the Word. Need to be studying their Bible. Knowing the Word of God. Knowing the truth. The Bible says that He is the truth. That He'll set you free. If you want to be on the straight, 
and you want to enter in, you need to know the truth. You need to know the Word of God. I'd hate to be there. You know what my, my wish is, and I'm probably being a little proud saying it. When I, when I see Jesus, when He says enter in, I want to hear Him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Just what, what little bit I got, I do all the can for Him. I want to hear that. I'd hate to get to I think I'm going in and hear him say, I never knew you. Oh, yeah. Depart from me. You knew me, but I never did know you. It's a personal relationship. That's what it is. I think that's to all of us. I think that's to those, that, if I was one of those preachers or teachers or whatever that teaches anything other than the Word of God, I would really, they probably never read that verse. I would hate to think that that would ever happen. But I think about that funnel that Bernie McGee talked about. Going in, that, going in. I went in, some of y'all, Don's a new Christian, somebody, I went in not knowing what to expect. That song they sung. I don't know, I didn't know anything then about the future, and I don't know anything about the after right now the future. But when I got saved that night, I entered in that little straight gate. There's a narrow way down there in that little church. And I've watched God just make it wider and wider. You know, getting saved was a great thing. Getting in church was a great thing, having faith. And then God called me to preach at 55, 56 years old. And then getting to be a pastor of this little church where everybody loves everybody and God's here with us. I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow, but I know who holds tomorrow. That song, I know exactly. And all I'm doing is following Him. And I'm on the narrow road. I'm on that narrow road. Amen. Amen. I've been out quite a few dead ends in that thing. You know, if you don't stay focused on where you're going, You'll veer off to the right or the left. I've done that. We all have, probably. And we will. But my prayer today is that you're one of the few. If you're not one of the few, you can be one of the few today. The Bible says if you believe in Him and confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead and ask Him He'll save you. I hope and pray that everybody in here has done that. Charlie, if you'll come, if you haven't want to give an invitation, this altar is open if you need prayer for whatever reason. Or if you're not sure, maybe God spoke to your heart, and, or maybe maybe you're off that road. Maybe you've made a right turn or a left turn, and you need to come back and get, get on the straight road, the narrow road with the Lord. The altar is open.